Hi, I'm Ruth Werner. Welcome to my audiovisual sidebar to accompany my feature article, Diabetes Diversity, and my Pathology Perspectives column, Complications of Diabetes. And the title of this short piece is Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Insulin But Were Too Confused to Ask. Let's begin with just a short history of insulin. Until about a hundred years ago, diabetes was essentially a death knell. Children with this disease did not survive to adulthood. Adults who developed a different form of the disease had no treatment options either, and they also typically died. Early researchers discovered that the key missing chemical in people with diabetes was manufactured in structures in the pancreas called the islets of Langerhans, which I always thought sounded like a nice honeymoon spot. The hormone manufactured in these islet cells was named insulin because insula means island. And the first human subject to receive a dose of animal sourced insulin was a 14 year old child in Toronto. In 1923, a group of the earliest researchers won a Nobel Prize for their life saving work. Early forms of insulin were derived from cattle and pigs, but many patients developed allergies to these animal products. It wasn't until 1978 that synthetic forms of insulin were developed, and in 1982, they became commercially available. Now, at this point, we could go down a whole rabbit hole about what has happened with insulin prices, which would raise my blood pressure and my blood glucose, but can we skip that, please? So let's instead talk about what insulin does. As I was preparing these articles and also um, developing a continuing education class on diabetes, I found some useful illustrations on Wikipedia about this. Let's start here, though, with a couple of silly drawings that I just did myself. Here's a hungry cell. It's surrounded by glucose, but the glucose can't get in. I sometimes talk about insulin as a kind of porter, as if it carries the sugar into those hungry cells. So here is our hero, insulin, carrying sugar into the cells. And oh, look, everyone is happy. In real life, of course, it's much more complex. Here's a picture of what happens with type 1 diabetes. It's normal on the top where the insulin represented by the little blue ball tells the receptor to open up and let the sugar in. But without insulin, we get the picture on the left where there's no insulin and the cell membrane stays closed. So the cell goes hungry and the sugar accumulates in the bloodstream. In type 2 diabetes, of course, we have at least some insulin, but a lot of our cells are insulin resistant. That is, they don't do what they should and open up their receptor sites to sugar, even when insulin is part of the picture. So here on the left, we have a normal situation, the blue ball and the open channel. And on the right, we have a blue ball and a closed channel followed then by hyperglycemia, high blood sugar, and this is, of course, a setup for some big problems. Discussions of diabetes typically focus on how insulin functions to allow glucose to enter the targeted cells, and that's an important job, obviously. But insulin does other things, too, and we're discovering more about it daily. Insulin helps to transfer fats out of the blood and into adipocytes. It helps brain function and the heart and the kidneys and even hair follicles to do their work. Insulin helps to prevent osteoporosis because it stimulates osteoblasts and it inhibits osteoclasts. And there are some hints that it helps to protect the endothelial lining of blood vessels from damage that can lead to cardiovascular disease, the leading cause of death of people with diabetes. So insulin does a lot more than prevent diabetes, and being deficient in insulin can have repercussions that go far beyond high blood sugar. All right, so we know that being able to secrete and use insulin is good, but... Can there be too much of a good thing? 
As a person progresses toward type 2 diabetes, their insulin levels also often go up for a time. And this is a response to insulin resistance, right? The cells are hungry, they can't access sugar, and the body perceives this as a call to produce more insulin. The islet cells comply, insulin levels rise above normal. This state of elevated insulin, hyperinsulinemia, carries some negative consequences before diabetes even develops. The main causes of hyperinsulinemia are insulin resistance and obesity, which often go hand in hand. And I can't explain all this equally here, but the data shows that hyperinsulinemia can damage myocardial cells, leading to fibrosis and even heart failure. It can initiate a hormonal cycle that raises blood sugar. It's associated with chronic systemic inflammation, high triglycerides, atherosclerosis, and Alzheimer's disease. Eventually, producing excess insulin exhausts the pancreas, and then levels drop well below normal. This is hypoinsulinemia, which of course goes along with hyperglycemia, low insulin, high blood sugar, type 2 diabetes. So that's a short foray into the wonderful world of insulin. It's good. We like it. But to stay healthy, as with all our hormones, we want to have it in the right amounts and at the right times.